Chancellor at Essex University last week. I was at Bristol University on Thursday night giving a lecture there. There it was, if I may say so, what I would call an unscripted, off-the-cuff lecture. Today, I'm afraid I can't offer you that because I have got some quite fully and carefully prepared remarks which I would like to share with you. But before I do so, two final preliminaries. First, I'm a big fan of Miranda. I met Miranda much earlier this year when I spoke to a group of distinguished lawyers and she beetled up to me and said, are you aware of my foundation? And at that point I wasn't and she told me about it and she said, would you come and talk to us? And I said, in principle, I'd be delighted to do so. She is, as you know, a successful barrister. She's a successful banker. She's a successful entrepreneur. But most importantly of all, and I bet Veronica and James, her mum and dad are very <coughs> proud, she's now proving to be, on a huge scale, a successful progressive change maker, channeling all that she's gained by way of experience and accomplishment and the facilitation and leadership of change to try to achieve a better community. And very specifically, so far as diversity is concerned, you know what her mission is. Her mission is to try to ensure that people from BAME, from disadvantaged, from <coughs> underrepresented communities are given the hope and where necessary, not least thanks to her and her foundation, the wherewithal to make progress not an abstract concept but a deliverable fact and that I think is a remarkable contribution to public life and to the improvement of the society around her. So Miranda, I regard myself as a friend and I'm extremely honoured that you've asked me to speak. The very last preliminary is this, there is one quite sensitive matter of which I think your natural courtesy might disincline you to treat. You will probably not wish to raise it with me directly. But which, if unaddressed, might lurk mischievously and perhaps even from my vantage point perilously in the undergrowth. <coughs> Unless I deal with it at the outset, so I shall. And that is the sensitive matter <coughs> of height. Now, very specifically, it has been bruited in some of the more down market parts of the media, that I'm the shortest man ever to be Speaker of the UK House of Commons. So let me say to you, my friends, ladies and gentlemen, one and all, with all the rhetorical force and insistence of my father, there's nothing wrong with being short. I don't know who, because you're all seated, or virtually all seated, but on the law of averages, the chances are that a proportion of you share that characteristic of vertical challenge with me. We may be short, but we may also be and judge ourselves to be perfectly formed. In any case, I have to make a virtue of necessity, ladies and gentlemen. I have always been short. I'm now 55 years old and I remain short. And given the known impact of the aging process on physiognomy, the chances are that I will become inexorably and irrevocably shorter still. And about the fact of that continued and soon to be exacerbated shortness, I'm as intensely relaxed as Peter Mandelson once famously, or in some people's minds infamously, declared that new labour was intensely relaxed about people getting filthy rich. But I'm not intensely relaxed about the matter of historical accuracy. You would expect the speaker, forsooth, to have done his research. And I think I can say that if in no other respect, at least in this respect, I should not disappoint you. I have done. It's quite wrong when some of these more down-market, low-musical, fifth-rate scribblers say, oh, well, Berkeley was the shortest man ever to be speaker. Sir John Bussey, <coughs> Speaker of the UK House of Commons, from 1394 <laughs> to 1398, Sir John Wenlock, Speaker from 1455 to 1456, and Sir Thomas Tresham, we mustn't forget him, speaker in 1459, are all believed to have been shorter than I am. <laughs> Although I do have to admit that this was true only after all three of them had been beheaded. <laughs> Indeed, no fewer than seven of my predecessors met their end on the executioner's block. One was killed in battle and a further unfortunate soul was brutally murdered. So you will understand that this 
does enable me to view the woes and 